Are women not truly equal to men in Islam because they can't be appointed prophets or imams? Let's take a look. Hello there, peace be on you. My name is Anne-Marie and welcome back to another episode of Spotlight. It's no secret that since time immemorial, women have had the greater burden with regards to childcare and child rearing. It's a common experience that a healthy child develops a very strong attachment to its mother, which lasts a few years before the child becomes more independent. Several studies looking at this crucial relationship between a young child and its mother all conclude the same thing. Newborns and older babies need their mothers constantly to be there, night and day, in order to develop to their full potential, both physically and mentally. This crucial time even has an impact late into adolescence. One study looked at a child's cognitive skills and linked this with the amount of time the child spent with its mother in their early years and showed that the positive effect of mothers spending time with their children was large. It was equivalent in magnitude to between 20 and 40% of the advantage that young children enjoy from having a mother with a university degree as opposed to having a mother with no qualifications. It's no secret then that for a significant chunk of a woman's life, prioritizing her young children when they need her most means that she will often have to put her other responsibilities and activities to one side for a period of time. Bearing the duty of prophethood or caliphate doesn't allow for this. A prophet or imam is required to be available constantly, night and day, a little like how a mother is needed for a young baby. There is no setting aside the duties of a prophet there is no prioritizing other responsibilities over this duty and role. It becomes their sole occupation, their sole concern. If women can't give their full attention to the position of prophethood, then that means they either can't fulfill their young children's needs when they need them most, or they can't fulfill their role as a prophet. Both roles require immense devotional sacrifice. Another aspect when looking at this is the physical toll that a woman's physiology goes through on a monthly basis. As a result of menstruation, women can become anemic and go through hormonal changes that can cause tiredness, pain, lethargy, and in some cases, even nausea and vomiting. According to the World Health Organization, globally, anemia affects nearly 25% of the world's population. The population group with the greatest number of individuals affected is non-pregnant menstruating women. In Islamic practice, women can't engage in prayer or fasting during these monthly cycles or immediately after childbirth. They can engage in other forms of remembrance of God, but prayer and fasting are abrogated for them as a form of God's mercy. That these ritual obligations, so key to the Islamic faith that they constitute its pillars, are annulled for women during these times highlights that this time can be physically demanding for many women. They don't need to play catch up either and make up for it later. It's almost as if God knows when we're having a hard time. Who knew? An Imam or Khalifa is required to be on hand day in, day out and to fulfill duties such as leading congregational prayer, meeting families with problems that require counsel and tending to the organisational needs of the community at large. They also need to be physically ready to receive direction from God through revelation and other types of spiritual experiences. If a woman by default can't always be available at all times, then the obligations of this role would be neglected. But so what, I hear you say? That still means women are excluded from attaining the same spiritual ranks of prophethood and caliphs, right? Wrong. Women can attain the same spiritual station of being God's beloved servants as that of prophets and caliphs, even if they aren't assigned that title and duty. Indeed, it has been women that have been cited in the Qur'an as models for the believers. In chapter 66, the Qur'an states, And Allah sets forth for those who believe the example of the wife of Pharaoh, when she said, My Lord, build for me a house with thee in, in the garden, and deliver me from Pharaoh and his work, and deliver me from the wrongdoing people. And the example of Mary, the daughter of Imran, who guarded her private parts, so we breathed into him of our spirit and she fulfilled in her person the words of her Lord and his books and was one of the obedient. Women such as Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the wife of Pharaoh have both been cited as examples for all believers, both men and women. 
Women are therefore not excluded from the personal spiritual benefits of prophets or caliphs. Women can experience direct communication from God through revelation, visions and true dreams too. It is simply that women are exempted from the function of public spiritual leadership. In our pursuit of being materially equal to men in every respect, we negate the everyday reality of what it's like to be a woman in today's society. Being equal doesn't need to mean being identical. The Quran declares women equal to men clearly by stating women have similar rights on men as men have over women, but it also recognizes our differences. In seeking equality in modern day, have we lost sight of a key part of what it means to be a woman by disregarding the importance and difficulties of motherhood? Have we made an unrealistic and burdensome expectation on women to carry both roles in society simultaneously? Muslim women don't need saving from their Islam. They need reminding of their Islam. Reminding that it was Islam that brought to them their right to inheritance, the right to divorce, the right to choose their spouse, their right to work, their right to an education, to name a few. It was Islam that brought them spiritual equality and equal rewards in deeds, whereas in other religions they are looked down upon as the origin of sin itself. In short, women don't need to have the chance to be prophets or caliphs simply because all doors of absolute nearness to God are open to them. Their gender is no barrier to attaining the highest station of a believer in Islam. And this idea of women being robbed of the opportunity of public spiritual leadership is misguided. The duty of a prophet or caliph is to be entirely dedicated to the community they're sent to guide. It's not a position of grandeur or opportunity. In fact, it's a burden and responsibility that requires immense sacrifice. It's a responsibility one would never want to be placed upon their shoulders if one truly understood its sacrifice. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our channel. Visit our website www.rationalreligion.co.uk for more content. Thanks for watching. Peace be on you.